You know, when I first came here at Bank of America, I told them I was working for Bank of America, I said, you gave me a funny look. I didn't really know what they meant until six years later in 2009 when things started to happen and all of a sudden I found myself in the new seat succeeds performer on the shopping spot. So I went through that part of it and after that occurred, there was really no, uh, those of you who were here in 2009 probably know, there was not a whole lot of work here in Charlotte, especially for seat managers and, you know, sort of like the HR so I started, I took a job in Washington, D.C. because I didn't want to be unemployed in my community, D.C. working for me. And then, as often occurs, sometimes if you're in a manager position and you're using certain vendors, if you get laid off, they, they want to hire you because you've done good things for them. So that led to me being hired by a middleware company that did measurement type of solutions for determining if a company's training spent derived ROI and stuff data out of databases and sort of rationalize it. And that led us to working with the Department of Defense and the Chief Learning Officer there, Reese Madsen. So for several years, I was in the Office of Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence as a program manager. I know all the players now. When I see him on TV, it breaks my heart. This clapper who I used to present to and stuff was really a good guy. In fact, OE and I, when he was running it, was one of the best places to work in DC. The tree it was highly diverse and treated people well. Brennan, I also know him for being, let's just say, he couldn't take it. He felt that he, he had culpability in this thing. He didn't bring strong to the service and therefore was responsible for a lot of what's happening. That's why I'm here now. So I know these people. All I want to say is that what happened is uh, the realization that the education system wasn't producing what people needed. So I'm going to show you. Did anybody see me present at InfoGuard two years ago? Or at ISC squared four years ago. Okay, if you saw me present then, I talked about educational policy. Now I'm going to talk to you about something that's actually not going to try to address the situation today. Next, this program, uh, sponsored by the Cybersecurity Workforce Alliance, which is a very fancy way to say J.P. Morgan Chase and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. That's what put the money up initially to see this. And uh, IQ4, which is a startup company. Uh, they are, uh, IQ4 is a for profit entity, it's not not for profit, although it's producing a program that's not for profit. What I'm going to do today is I'll give you an overview of this program and then uh, a high level description. I'm going to reverse the bullets. I'm going to go into a deeper uh, depiction of the program and then I'll, if we have time, I'll get into the um, specific research I did around one implementation at uh, State University of New York and Baldwin. Um, how many people here have children who are between the ages of, say, one year old and, say, 30? Anybody? Okay. So, uh, this is going to be particularly relevant to you because part of this is where the jobs are. Now, that this doesn't mean you're going to do the job. I had a daughter who's just getting back from China tomorrow. She's 17 years old and she wants to do music theater. Which of course makes my hair stand on end because of what I know, but on the other hand, to destroy the dreams of your children is not something that one can do in a way that doesn't have consequences maybe for the future. So it's just interesting to note that you can lead them to the water, but you can't make them drink. But if you have an influence on your children or relatives or grandchildren, something that's important to recognize is that. Uh, and by the way, the first section of this is what I could go to to sell my program. So you'll just use my own ideas. But I could present unless I use their slides, but I added my own to that. So just so you know, part of what's going to happen here is you're going to get pitched about the program. You're also going to get potentially recruited if you want to be mentors in the program. And I'll explain more about that later. Um, so, you know, they recognized, uh, based on research in this, that there are going to be a trillion dollars in cyber tech and services by 2020, 3.5 million cybersecurity job vacancies by 2021, zero unemployment if you can do those skills. Unfortunately, though, there are people who can do the job, so various entities are trying to train up quickly. You want to know what's going on? <clears throat> Watch your patterns. When you're on the internet, pushing out all these commercial college cybersecurity programs, people are, know what's going on now. 
five years ago, people really didn't know this. Now it's widely held. The question is, what do you do to get a job in cybersecurity? Now, how many people here work in cybersecurity? One, and frankly, you all do if you're in IT. You may not be specialists, but if you're not aware of some of the principles of uh, info protection, particularly, you haven't been taking your boring compliance training very well. Uh, there's something useful in it. Uh, we can discuss that too. So, at any rate, uh, they make some claims about the program, and there's somebody who is um, been evaluating, and I'll try to give you the truth as well as the, the marketing point. So, the first thing that's interesting for you to look at, tell me if you agree with When HR carves out a role description for a cybersecurity professional, these are the kind of things they're looking for in the resume, right? A bachelor's degree is an advance, but it's not critical. If you have a community college associate degree, but you have these other credentials and experience, you can still get a very, very good job. Does anybody know what the starting salary for a CISO is now? The average starting for a CISO. You know what you know what CISO is? That's okay. Anybody else have a guess? Higher than that. Three and a quarter for a CISO. That's a chief information security officer. Now, you might ask yourself, how is it possible that the OPM, the Office of Personnel Management, could lose like 15 million records and then find out six months, it took six months to announce it? Probably, if you look closer, you find out the paper performance package was due the month before the announcement of the Do you all follow my logic there? Because once the stuff is compromised, that's right. So, what's interesting is often what happens is they contain the damage until the right time. There's no law that says you have to report and you have a big breach, like say Target, before you report your answer. So there's some very interesting stuff here about compliance with the truth in relation to cybersecurity. And you think about this, hacking, you know, it's like, do we want to admit that uh, you're in your underwear? I don't think so. So generally speaking, it's trying to mitigate the problem, not admit to the problem. There's something about risk analysis here, which is obviously very important as well, is also tricking people in a company to admit they have an issue. Um, some of you may be familiar with some of the simulations that are being used now for phishing to identify within a company those who click on the email. And if you know about quick point analysis, anybody familiar with that concept? What they do is they just go back and dig in who, who's the one who clicked and then they use something called social engineering, which is a nice way of saying they lay them off or if they're, you know, see they have something in the train. But um, just, you know, to be aware of the fact that these kind of tests or phishing tests are becoming widespread now as a way to kind of determine that the company's policy towards phishing is really being adopted by all the employees. So anyway, the bad news is these people don't exist. They are the, you know where they exist the most? When I was working on the uh, ISC Square um, CCISP program, I observed the old school so I could do the conceptual design for the new one. And what I discovered in Washington, they were doing it in a place called Vienna, Virginia. Some of you may know it's a, you know, it's like an IT hub that's all you see, you know, over the last, you know, Bruce Allen, Al, Allen Hamilton, all the movie area. And when I came in, I was astounded. The audience taking that that program were all like the older folks in here, you know, the guys in their 50s. Not too many women, I'm afraid. But I didn't want to look like a man in the group, but, uh, you know, dress like one. And you all have more power to it, you could make it. But the bottom line was, it was all older men. Why? Because in the Washington, D.C. area, they're trying to maintain relevance and keep their jobs. So they're updating their certifications. But it turns out the real problem isn't the entrenched, it's the new people coming in. And the problem is how long it takes them to come up to see them. So they're pushing the idea of this, this program as a form of a mentorship or internship. Internships have been scandalous in recent education because people come out and they get an internship and they're not paid. So who can afford it? Generally, children of rich people or people who are living in a less expensive city. They don't get paid, they, get, they work for nothing, but they definitely get better prepared than those who don't have internships, so they have a competitive edge. Whether they get the job or not depends on how many other interns there are. Not every internship leads to a job, and obviously it's, it's pretty important. So 
This is promoting a mentorship model, and I'll show you kind of how it works. Uh, there's a lot of uh, claims around this, uh, and uh, some of you may know some of these. Uh, like, for example, this this is important. This National Cybersecurity Workforce Framework. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it was developed by NIST, and what it does is it carves up all the various roles and responsibilities by job title um, in the cybersecurity, in a cybersecurity workforce. And the reason it was written up was to help hiring managers and cybersecurity CISOs know how to, how to staff. And uh, there's a whole, anybody here ever been in the military? Anyone in the army? Okay, so there's the way that jobs are described in the army is with something called KSAs. Knowledge, skills, and attributes. And those KSAs are used to create what are called job roles or profiles. So they did the same approach was used to create different types of cybersecurity roles, different, different domains of knowledge required within that role, and they have galleries of competencies. I mean, millions of dollars were spent on this, and it's worth knowing about because it's free. If any of you are hiring managers involved with hiring, it's not bad to look at this stuff. And it, all, it basically falls into you know this a very large framework uh, according to this. Support in the center, operate and maintain, protect and defend, investigate, operate and collect, analyze, operate and collect is a repeating pattern. I'm just giving it so you, you can hear kind of what I'm referring to. And then it, mating that framework of jobs against um, some kind of a virtual mentorship model or trade mark. And then uh, industry design. So now we're starting to get into where this this becomes quite interesting and a little bit bizarre. Because those of you who have, I bet everyone in this room has dealt with academia, either as a student or as a teacher or as your children, the academic culture and the business culture. I mean, talk about a weird burger how those two entities can sort of talk to each other. And, and let's let's be frank about this, you know. You would buy stock in a factory that produced a product that nobody wanted to buy. You wouldn't do it. Yet, parents are being asked to pay $60,000 plus tuition for the type of education that result in they can't get a job. So there's something bizarre about that to start with. But in addition to that, the business attitude towards education and human development, if it were uniformly as humane as a place like Microsoft, I guess, uh, the reputation is that it really encourages development, training, it helps pay for that sort of thing. But when they think training, they're thinking ROI. There's no learning for its own sake. And in fact, where you see that happening, typically what ends up occurring is those people are isolated in, in a world of kind of uselessness. So let me give you an example of what I mean, okay? If you are in a bank, how many people work in, in the bank here? Okay, so more so than other places, banks actually calculate a fiduciary model of what they get in return for the training. So in other words, even required training, like when I ran client training at BOA, I had to know how many minutes it took for them to complete that training, because minutes equal productivity, or minutes not producing equals lack of productivity. So there's something here about education for its own sake, which is a noble thing if you think about it in some respects, versus education with an end goal that is measurable and quantifiable. And there's cultural differences between those, which is important to realize this kind of a program has to reconcile, or at least get them to play nice with each other. So it's like getting deans, for example, of John Jay to play nice with industry folks who are trying to come in who don't really, they're not teachers, so they're mentors. So where do they fit in the academic world? And the answer is they don't. So part of what we're trying to do is essentially is to create a cultural transformation here as part of this. And the universities have some incentive, you'll see why in a little while, and business has a definite incentive, which is based on something called speed to competence. And how long it takes to get a college graduate, for example, and train them up versus have someone come and ready to go to work in one capacity or another. 
So, you know, it brings the workplace into the classroom. That's an interesting concept when we're doing that. It helps to build expertise not available education. So here's an interesting thing that we'll, again, we'll revisit later. What's the most important thing to succeed in a corporate environment? Is it knowledge or is it emotional intelligence? You think emotional intelligence. Somebody else? What's more important, knowledge oh. or knowing it? All right, emotional intelligence is mine serving the oh. If you can't play, you know, uh, at Bank of America, they measure you on the how and the what. So you can come in and be a, a bloody Jesus, genius. If you don't know how to apply that in a way that allows for success of people around you, you know, the old saying, they crown me under the bus. You know, that's another way of saying you told the truth that the person didn't do the job sometimes. But you can't do it that. You have to be able to negotiate successfully and emotionally. And ask yourself this question. When you were in college, did they ever teach you any soft skills, life skills? No. Actually, did they teach you that in high school? No. Where did you learn it? I learned it in the Boy Scouts myself. That's where I learned life skills. You know, I mean, how about you? If you're in the military, they taught you life skills. I, I see my daughter, she's 17 years old, you know, I mean, she doesn't even know how to write correctly. That's the kind of stuff they teach you in the military, how to live, how to keep healthy. And in addition to that, in the corporate world, for example, you have to learn how to work on a team. And it's not like you work on it for one afternoon and then you go away and you hate your guts. That's that. In the corporate world, you have to learn how to deal with long-term <coughs> teams with people who may be different than you, who may be less intelligent than you, who may know more than they have an axe to run, who the heck knows. But the bottom line is they don't teach you that in college right now. So you can't really function in a corporate environment because if you think about it, you don't do anything in a corporate environment that isn't team-based. And cyber is absolutely critical about that team. So part of what's interesting about this is on the face of it, it looks like you're teaching them cybersecurity skills. But it turns out that the, the uh, EQ, the emotional intelligence called for for them to work in a team and to integrate the content together turns out to be a big deal. And that's what we mean by this notion of work with skill capacity. Augmentation, speed, and flexibility. I don't know just words that are Output cutting three, six months. So there it is. So this is your this is your bottom line. You can cut three to six months out of the new hire spin up time for productivity. And you may know that companies like J.P. Morgan Chase, they don't trust uh, the certified bodies. I mean, they want you to have the CIS. CP is it? CIS. Okay. That's the, that's the, the uh, what I would call the basic. And then, you know, it's different from cloud, so you have to really get into the cloud stuff if you want to be credible. But uh, they don't trust anymore that you know your stuff because you're certified. They actually have a new cyber range. But you have to go in and demonstrate it if you're going to get a high paid job. They'll put you through a simulated test. And the other entity, which is, I don't know what Microsoft is doing, uh, if anything, but IBM, uh, they're starting a program sponsored by the Singaporean government that every computer science student who leaves, before they get their final degree, they have to go through a program where they are in a cyber range dealing with breaches observed by a coach. And then after they come out of their three hour whatever um, performance based assessment, a coach debriefs them on all the choices they made and why they made it, etc. So IBM is now essentially selling that same service to companies in the US to test their people. And so performance based assessment versus paper pencil. So there's some real questions about the value of certifications. The value do you, do you really do the job? Do you have one? Mm, maybe. Or it's, uh, I'm trying to think, what was it Bugs Bunny who said it's a possibility? But not a very good one, unfortunately. Um, okay, so this gives you an idea of this program, a high level view of it. You know, it's kind of an odd slide, but, but basically, you know, in May 2017, only 15% got jobs or interviews. So you see what the business case is here. The idea is we can give you, we can't give you a full internship, but we can give you a, a virtual internship, internship, which is better than no internship. So let's start with that as a baseline. A place-based internship where you're paid to do the job is the best. 
You can't get that. This kind of virtual relationship is probably better. That's that's the book. Now, we started out just in August 15 with 17 students running pilots, and you can see gradually the numbers got up. Uh, you know, by 2018, we expect to have 1,500 students. The institutions that we work with are Sydney University of New York, John Jay, NYU, University of Washington, um, and others. And it's, it, this is the kind of thing that's expanding. You'll see why as, as it unfolds. It uh, turns out that it's, it's a way to open the minds of college kids who have no exposure to the business world, and it also helps mentors brush up on their own skills, as it turns out, in some ways. So, you know, some of the some of the stats on here are interesting. 99% of the people who sign up for the course have no awareness of uh, cybersecurity as a place where they could get opportunities for employment. 95% had, uh, had never had any real world experience. That's changing, because as we scale up the institutions we're involved with, we're getting a lot of non-traditional students. Non-traditional students is another way of saying people who work jobs, have families, are trying to better themselves by taking a course of study. That's a non-traditional student. And non-traditional students have different types of drivers than this. And I would say that 95% of her had real, real world work experience. That's not necessarily the case for who we're starying to see now. But that's who you would find at NYU, for example. Uh, who are all, most of the people we work with there as undergraduates who are in computer science programs come from pretty affluent backgrounds. And they're there, they have all the time in the world. And you go to Queens, which is like Brooklyn College, Queens College, most of them are non traditional students. So your expectations of those students has to be different than the ones who have our full time students. And if you think about it, your non traditional students are better served by virtual type things because often they're not in a school campus. Um, and it also lends itself to these rapid intelligence. So, okay, so, uh, right. Uh, so part of what they do is, in this program, it's a semester long program, it meets once a week, but in between they learn how to do uh, memos, they have to create infographics, uh, they also produce videos. And I'm going to show you what a curriculum looks like in a minute so you know what you're studying. But I want to give you an idea of what they produce. All of these are produced collaboratively. So they have to work as a team to produce this. And they have to, they have to put this stuff up on a platform that then the mentors review. And then when they come together in the class, the mentors come in on go to a meeting. You're all familiar, I'm sure. You guys have little video images. And the students present. And they are simulating themselves as a team who is on a consulting engagement to help the live today discover how a breach occurred and how they're going to fix it in the future. I'll show you some more about that. The class itself is a business simulation. It is not a class. When the students come in, we say, look, we're putting you in teams. Each of you are a consulting team. You're all competing against each other to get the bank's business. You're all going to have the same documents, and now you're going to have to go through the process of winning the bank's business. And so what's interesting about this is they never do simulations like this either. They might do a simulation for you know a period, you know, like a course session, but the whole semester, that's a different story. And what we discovered is that it turns out the first time a lot of times students do this, they don't get it until the end of the semester. That's when it starts settling in. And what we discovered is if we bring in people who, who want to come in, who've taken the course. We give them a role we call workplace peers, and now they become the sort of managers of those teams. And that has made a huge difference because they know what to expect and what to help them. It really, it's really very much like a practice. So, uh, a little bit more here. So, again, more of this stuff. So, why this kind of works is this breaks down, as you can see, we'll talk about CEO, CISOs, and risks. And all managing all functions and then cyber uh, job hiring. So there's some interesting stuff um, for each of these. All right. So first of all, you know, they, they, these are this column is essentially what the, what these folks want based on various uh, kinds of field research. 
They want you to be able to work for Australia, and they want them to hit the ground running. And then you can see the East Harbor Security Workforce delivers, you know, special learning, completed internship mentored by SMEs. There's that KSA's, assess KSA's experience. You know, I'm an educator, so you know, you'll excuse me when I see marketing type, I get a little but you know, it is moving direction like this, okay? And uh, the case, part of my work with this entity, which has only been around for three years, is to help make this stuff true. Because if you, if you ask yourself if they're working as a team the whole time, you've got the same challenges you have on the job. How many of you have been in a situation where you're working on a team, and everybody's supposed to be working together, and then it becomes performance appraisal time? Now, who gets credit? for what happened. Who gets the most credit? Who gets the least credit? All right, now, that can often be mitigated by the fact that you, you, you support each other. If you have a good manager, they won't have you. They won't assess you the way they want to kill each other. They'll be fair. But when you're in a school context where you get a grade, how do you, how do you measure the difference between individual versus group work? It turns out that's a big challenge. And why? Because typically in a team of six, there's one or two who carry the other four, unfortunately. And uh, so we're working on that. Yes? A couple of things. One is, in, in my area, we call it 80 20 rule. Yeah. Or, or 20 80 rule. 20% of people do 80% of the work. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how that's different from what's actually the experience it's not, when they get out. It's not, well, oh, that's a darn good point. <laughs> But there still has to be some what we would call fairness. Okay, and the, this, process. the second thing I wanted to ask you about was I understand that 100% want people to hit the ground running. But my experience in almost, and I've been in multiple jobs in my age, that it takes about a year for anybody to break even for whoever they're working for. So, what better? I mean, it's great. And these are people who are. You know, I've worked with lawyers. Law, law firms expect you know a year before they. But uh, think of it as think of this as more entry level positions. So if you hire a college graduate and they have no background at all, no exposure to it, it's, what this program does is it accelerates at least their understanding where you place them down three months. So you said a year, so we want you to quantify that difference. And, and honestly, given the dearth of people in this area. I mean, you all know how serious the lack of cybersecurity professionals is. I mean, here in this town, you know, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's covered. I, just, I, I really don't know, although my impression is it's not. I mean, I've, I've spoken, for example, at friends who are chief administrative officer of Key Bank, which is a regional. And I, I asked them, what's your biggest worry? What's your biggest headache? Because as a consultant, I always like to train and he said, we just can't find the talent. He said, you can't imagine what we're paying. Now, that's not just for cybersecurity, but that is mostly for cybersecurity. It's unbelievable. And, uh, and then what ends up happening, and why Chase invested in this is, they just said, we can't do it anymore. We can't hire people. Find $50,000 and then find out six months later, they really can't do it. It's just, we can't do it anymore. And at the same time, they have need. That's why they put in their own cyber. Because they felt they wanted to performance assess whoever, whenever, to know if they can actually do the work. And that's the challenge. Yes? To me, cybersecurity involves a level of integrity. Are these students screened in any way? No. They, and they self select to take the course. You know, it's like if you were going to a university, you could choose to take any course. So that, if you were at the upper level of pre grad and so But no, there's no ethical screening at all. And there's none in business either. There's none for the presidents. So, you know, I mean, ethics screening, I mean, you know, you're right. I mean, if someone's going to cheat, especially the insider threat, but that's why part of your team will be a psychologist. Because part of, what, because part of the game is to try to infer where the problems are going to be and to look at profiles where the greatest risk is using big data and then observe those people. Quick point analysis. If you haven't heard that term, be aware. Because what that essentially means is that they know what you do on your keyboard. I'll go even further. Are you aware of the new security procedures, which you can tell just by the pressure which you type? 
who you are. That's a new, by the way, that company's worth investing in. Do you know the name of the company? No, I just read it. That's worth buying. If you're interested in stock, that's a good one. I don't know. I can just tell you. But I can tell you you're going to find out. Unless, you know, what you do, just type in, uh, just type in, uh, 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 ID based uh, keyboard pattern recognition via ID. If you give me your name, we'll be happy to send you a card. Also, how long is your screen? Well, not, and one could argue, you know, uh, look, everybody talks about Facebook. Basically, you should do about the privacy stuff. That's nothing compared to what's going to happen with the Internet of Things and breach of privacy. I mean, they're, I think they're going to know they're going to know what you had for dinner last night because you're going to have smart toilets and things of that. It's going to be that the TV in. Now, if your grandma lives at home, that's probably a good thing because then you can adjust her prescription doses. But you know, there's just be aware of the fact that Facebook. Everyone's reaction to Facebook is just the beginning of a much bigger issue that nobody wants to talk about. Talk about having those louder. Should have said, but talk about having their nose up here. Well, huh. the truth of the matter is, there are some instances where it's really quite useful, and others where it's really quite, uh, let's just say, intrusive. You, know, but you did say that they they got sensors in the toilets now. They just hold you to need. How many has anybody been in Japan recently? Did you raise your hand? You should go to Japan. It's very nice uh, I just passed through. I had I had uh, some work in uh, Bangkok and Phnom Penh, and so I, I flew on Nepal Airlines. And the toilets in the international airport are unbelievable. I mean, they're so well designed. I mean, it doesn't have everything. That's all. So <laughs> Everything you could, you know, whether you're French or English or wash and dry, wash and dry, <laughs> sanitize. But then the next level up is blood pressure, fluid analysis, all <coughs> fiber out to your medical clinic or your pharmacy. That's all existing in China. It's not just the future; it's here now. They tend to not go to China. So just be not even know. <coughs> So, uh, you know, the next line, your high level, you know, they want their cyber aware, they want them at least trained on it, they have some kind of, based on what CD, CD, cyber security workforce lines, they give them best practice framework training, which is another way of saying they know the national cyber security framework and how they might fit into it. It helps to reduce risk, it's combined with this great, avoid risk, saves money, reputation insurance, meaning if they hire someone, they're not going to have a, they're not going to get a lien up necessarily. Although, you can't legally revalue people for insanity. If you can work for craziness, or neurosis, or narcissism, you can do though, is you can security check them if they go along with the credit cards. Uh, and then lastly, you know, again, a lot of this stuff to me is vernacular, so I don't want to dwell on it very long. But the bottom line is, you know, it needs to be level of the organization. This kind of mentorship program helps all be successful. So, you know, here's again, there's more of this stuff, which shows you how it accelerates the speed by which this is your standard approach. And, uh, you know, well, you know, your, actually your time frame, your duration, sir, was right. If you look at this, it's almost like a year, is how long it takes them to get to the point of confidence. And then this program, you know, with the internship, this allows them to basically save three months in terms of bringing them up to speed. Here they're claiming six plus months, good fit higher, so they know that it's going to be a good fit. I'm sure you've heard about this concept. Hands and tension, you know, um, because they kind of know what you're talking about. Hire. Anybody who's dealt with recruiting and hiring at a big bank or a big corporation knows if you're not at the executive level, if you're coming in at a more entry level, just because they say they're hiring you for a role doesn't mean you're going to end up in that role. Once you're in, they have their way with you once you're in. Unless you have a rabbi somewhere above you who can make sure you're put in the right slot, if you're somebody new, you, you, you know, you could, they, you, you could, so like, I know this guy, he, for example, he was a, uh, you know, he was a commissioned officer, 
And he served in Afghanistan, and he came in, and he was hired by a company rep, and they promised that he'd be trading, and you know, working on the trading desk. And sure enough, his job was he sat at the trading desk and took everybody else's orders to kept track. So, you know, I mean, you just have to really, in this kind of a case, coming for cyber, you have an internship, you know what you want to do and you know how to ask. It's the biggest problem I noticed, especially with teenagers, they don't know what they want to do. You know, they haven't thought through what they could do. It's general. So this helps clarify the asking. And uh, uh, yeah, here's here's your uh, way it's scalable. The learners have no contextual experience with that certificates. You know, and then what happens is when you add on this mentoring, this virtual mentorship program, then what happens is these type of people who have backgrounds from post-sec behavioral compliance interact with those students who have no experience, and what you get is, you know, I've noticed the same message over and over again. Uh, you know, you can see team-based critical thinking communication skills, you know, the stuff I mentioned about the soft skills. So, uh, and then they have a big capstone event, which basically is a presentation. Now, I, I attended, uh, attended several of them. But the ones that are, what would happen is they take a situation where you had virtual mentors and the university, and then they would interact once a week for 15 weeks, and then they'd all come together for a grand presentation event at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, which had never been there. It's fancy as hell. The kids, it's very, very, very impressive. And it was a great moment. But now that we've shifted in order just virtual, that piece is missing. And we're going to have to figure out a way to replicate that. It makes things more special. So uh, I'm just going to, this is just your benefit slide, your, your business case. Um, it's all good. And then, you know, here's a list of the various wins. Now, you know what's interesting is this whole millennials engage. You know, the millennials become, like, in my opinion, the convenient women or man or girl. Of uh, our uh, workforce, and you know, I don't, I don't understand that. As someone who's worked with millennials, I don't find that to be the case. Today. I find it to be more principled and more willing to stand up for their values. What's really interesting is the next generation. Which, what, what do they call Generation C, or which is my daughter's generation, born after two thousand? Native. Uh, There's a name for them. I can't remember. Yeah, it's it's digital natives. Digital natives. Well, that of course, but there's something else though. Uh, it's not, you know, it's, they've got a name. They're different than millennials. But the truth is, this is an issue. Millennials really will up and walk if they don't feel that they're being used well. Some of you may have experienced that with your workforce or your children. But uh, these mentorships at least help them know more of what, what they're getting into, and apparently results in retention. Uh, no, that's before. That's before your millennials. The Gen Xers, there are many in this room who are taking over from the baby boomers. In fact, they're trying to get the baby boomers to leave as quickly as possible because they want them to promote themselves. All right, so as part of this IQ board, they have this concept of a passport, and in that passport, it's a platform. You, you have all these various, it's a little hard to see, you have a portfolio of projects, all your skills inventory, what your education was, your experience, your certificates that you've achieved, and personal highlights or rewards, all clickable through this interface, which also allows for profiling, Web.20, intelligent profiling, blah, blah, blah. And the IQ4 was going to use this to sell to companies that want to hire new people, a hiring budget. So that's part of their offer. But honestly, what we found is some schools, the students won't even touch it. They, they want to just do everything through notifications. They don't want to go over nothing. They want to use Snapchat. So part of what we discovered was it was even more effective to use Slack. Are you all familiar with Slack? Yeah. Slack they got into. Because if, if those of you, uh, how many people have seen it? So Slack is like a notification-based project management tool. It's quite powerful in some ways. And what's interesting is because you subdivide lines of projects and other things, 
uh, can be visible or non visible to people who are all together on it. It's quite an interesting platform and it works very well on mobile, which is the world of your, you know, 1920, 21, 22. They're not in the world of laptops. I mean, they'll use a laptop, but uh, I mean, it isn't here, it's just in your world. So, this, but this platform isn't used, and if you think about it, what it serves is, is a middleware solution where students and teachers and mentors put in data and recruiters then go and review this to determine who is interested. Or, if I apply for a job, I give you a link to my passport that has all of this stuff grained in a kind of a portfolio of who I am. Now, a lot of these are all popping up. This is one example. There are many other examples. The most famous is Degreed. If anyone's ever seen that, yes. I was going to say something is based on LinkedIn Well, what, yes, but only, but targeted specifically for cyber security professionals. But even LinkedIn, you know, the problem with LinkedIn is it was started before a lot of this stuff was even available. They've done a good job expanding and figuring out how to keep it paying. But um, yeah, it is. But there are there are dedicated platforms now just for recruiting. And if anybody knows of any really cool. HR talent management platforms that allow for, for example, curation and other things like that, please let me know because there are at least, I have four different chief administrative officers, uh, officers reading down my neck saying, Andrew, where is it? I don't know, I don't know. Because I, I, this I can't sell them because it's not generic. They want a generic talent management platform that's cool, not like crappy stuff like Talio. And some of the other. Has anybody looked for a job here in the last 10 years? Well, then you know about talent management, the, the requisition software, like Talio, there's some whole success work factors. Day. What was that? Workday. Work, what, yes, Workday. And all of these different platforms essentially are, are used to hire people in, but they can be very dehumanized, and millennials hate them. So people are looking for something that's a little bit more humane to work with, that treats you more like an individual, not just a resume. Uh, but at any rate, so that's part of what they, they have to offer. And then along the side, you get ratings. You notice this up here on your resilient strategy, where you learn all these various things. Where the inputs come from, I'm not sure, but that's hard to notice the best ASAs, knowledge, attributes, essential soft skills. So you get this whole kind of portfolio and overview of where you fit both in cybersecurity and where you fit in terms of your ability to work in corporations and software. How do you want Okay, now I'm going to skip past this section quickly and come back to you because I want to show you more about uh, the course itself. I think we'll find that more useful. By the way, the gen Generation Z, <coughs> IGN, Thank you, that's all it. Engine, they've got like a dozen different things. Yeah, yeah, but Generation Z is the common new generation thing. Were you born after 2000? Uh, 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 yeah, right. You see sort of a very tail <laughs> So I'm, I skipped over my, some of my findings because I think this is going to be more interesting for you. And we have time. Uh, you can go uh, back. So this, what you're looking at here is the schedule of topics in the course. Now remember, it's not really a course, it's a simulation. So everybody has to go out, the idea is that they're, you know, the team has to do due diligence. So all of this material, videos, articles, uh, various, you know, white papers, that's all week by week up on the passport on their kind of knowledge base, but they're doing the work to prepare to present to the mentors, either a memo, a scripted memo, or an info, uh, a one-pager, you know, info graph, or presentations. And so, you know, uh, you'll see, you know, this is what's in the course, and uh, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. We, we try to keep stuff. The one thing we're we're kind of working on now is adding a module on the dark web. Because it turns out it's very important that they know what it is and how to determine if people within the company are going up on the dark web or not. Now, like, why would anyone go onto the dark web? You know, 
Who the hell knows what the bottom line is? If they are going there, you won't know about it. And so there are some companies, uh, most notably, uh, they're called Blue Light Analytics out of Raleigh. They're all ex, um, mostly they're Air Force guys who work in cyber. Some of them work for NSA. They have a tool which can be used to scan your company's activity on the official internet to determine if people are going on the top. They're out of Raleigh, nice people. Young guys, really, really, they're starting. Um, so then you can see at the end here, uh, there's a final presentation preparation, and then the uh, last week of the uh, sessions. And, and this is kind of what it, um, uh, I'll, I'll show this in a second, we just get to finish through this. So here are the instructional objectives. Now what's interesting to know here is, nowhere on here does it say, and develop soft skills. What's happened is that turned out to be what was happening. But that wasn't the original intention of this program. Interesting. Second effect. Secondary uh, But this is, you know, this is the framework we used. You're all familiar with this. I'm sure you've been exposed to that. It's a cool place. Hopefully, we don't know about it in a few years. Identify, detect, protect, respond, recover is the, the you know, classic framework. And then these various other kind of high level objectives. Which again, notice it doesn't say uh, work in a team effectively. Uh, demonstrate ability to work independently as well as a part of a team. None of that stuff is up there. That all has to be at my part of my trying to help with it. Um, and then it starts out by providing uh, them a review of a case study around fraud, a case study around sabotage. A okay, study around intellectual property theft and then espionage. So they get a little bit of exposure to real world situations with those four themes. And then the main model case. A model case means they have one case study they work on all the way through the end. And that's this Goliath bank. Now, what's interesting is this is all the case material they get from the bank to set it up. And then week by week they get a little more trips and grabs of information that they're supposed to integrate. And one of the areas I think is a real challenge that we have to loose up is richer case material. Because honestly, what ends up happening is without bushing your case detail, everybody makes up their own sort of what happened. And you can end up with two different presentations that have completely different assessments of what's going on because there's nothing to assess of what's going on. The other thing is, those of you who have taken simulations, which I think are the best way to learn, know that <clears throat> the thing you learn the best is the case. Who the people are, you know, what's going on. That's what you learn the best. So if there's no cross-case comparisons, say not just in financial services, but let's say telecom, let's say high tech, it, the principles of cybersecurity are the same. But the implementation across these different industries can be very different. Just logical. So that's missing. Where that comes from is the mentors. It's not all the mentors are in financial services. I mean, they can come from government. You know, like we had the guy who was the head of cybersecurity in the National Park Service. Or they had the cybersecurity analysis for Cisco. Or just somebody who works for Fidelity. Lost. You know what I mean? In other words, they're high level people from all around, but they bring with them their perspective of whatever context they're in, which is great. But the way the students learn the most, of course, is the case, the deep case, and the investigation on their own. But so this is the situation, right? And they form it, they form into teams, their faculty forms into teams. And uh, all right, so let me now I'm going to go back and show you some stuff. First, let me just draw a little picture. Here. Any questions on doing this? You say that the mono cases there basically deal with the hypothetical and have a reasonable, uh, yeah, reasonable uh, explanations of what's going on, and and not just reasonable, but then they have other material that supports what typically might happen. A lot of it is they have to make it up. Now, of course, they get, besides that, they also get uh, the topography of the technology to look at what the firewall is, how things can be handled differently. 
they get more organization chart, they get a lot of other stuff as inputs. But, you know, initially that's all they get. Uh, are you actually saying that there's no definite answer at the given time until the end? Or? Well, yeah, there is. There, you know, the way it turns out is how well they bring the what happens to the client and what to do to the client. That's what the mentors are telling them they forgot or they didn't include. Now, the problem with that is there's a lot of gotcha. In other words, why did you think of this? Well, how would I know to think of that? I mean, I've never done this before. But now, that's another interesting thing about academia. Students do not receive direct feedback. Never. Again, on their papers. So as a result of that, this kind of a process where you're giving feedback in front of other people can be, you know, have to be very careful to avoid humiliation. Now, you find that the feedback we got from students, they said, I really like this, it felt like it was the real world, you know. Part of, I mean, you have to understand, those of you who have kids, I'm sure you realize this, it's like they're in La La Land. <laughs> to some extent, you know what I mean? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Maybe you're entitled to have that chance in your life before a hard, cold, practical world will send upon you. But the truth of the matter is, it's like La La Land. They don't have to like think about real world consequences. And that dis kind of disconnectedness is probably not a good thing. Because what it does is it makes, it makes the world into something separate from learning, which is a bad message. Do they really mind it? Humiliation, uh, not humiliating them. Seriously? Because that's really not how the real world is. Can't hear you. Being humiliated is part of the real world. Well, let's, uh, let's say receiving feedback, basically. You know, humiliation. I had a boss at BOA, and she humiliated everyone. So, from her original 20 DRs, when I served her, two of us were left at the end of the year. Half split because they couldn't take it. So, part of it being a good manager is not humiliating, but giving good feedback. And these mentors don't understand that. I mean, they really are passionate. But, you know, just. You know, just imagine this. Uh, okay, so uh, I just think it makes sense to show you. Uh, right. Uh, part of what I'm doing, I'm looking for mentors. If anybody's interested in learning more about what it takes to be a mentor, it's a good public relations thing for your company. And it's also probably good for you, especially if your company encourages civic engagement. The commitment's an hour and 30 minutes a week. And it lasts for 12 weeks. You meet a lot of cool people. I've got some quotes from you. Guys. I really think, if, especially if you like younger people and you enjoy interacting with them, I mean, this is a great opportunity because actually it makes you feel good. Okay, so I'm going to back up now to show you a little bit of some of my findings around this, which I think are interesting. It's a little bit verbose, but then so am I. It's a little bit verbose, but then so am I. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> All right. So, so basically, uh, as is often the case with commercial startups, even something with a noble purpose like this, they're always afraid of evaluation because the truth comes out. Okay? And the truth, so you can't call it evaluation. You call it continuous improvement. That's another way of saying evaluation. Good evaluation should be about continuous improvement anyway. Step by step. And I found that the worst thing I can do when I meet a group of people is, what do you do? Oh, I, I do evaluation. So, oh, really? Oh, thank you. Go away. So you're naturally evaluated when you're presented, you know. So I don't do that. But I will say that the study was to try to understand from the workplace peers and the mentors what they got out of it and then what suggestions they have to improve. So, you know, I just want to kind of go over this a little bit. Basically, it was done through focus groups and interviews. There was, there was one survey, but you know, everybody's been surveyed to death. In fact, I had a tool, uh, a French company hired me to help them sell a great tool, but it relied on surveys. And we took it to TIA, we took it to SunTrust, Bank of America, all to old friends of mine who would really like to have bought it. And as soon as we mentioned it was survey based, they went, eh. Now, we had 22 million surveys 
in the LMS system in Bank of America and, and when I was there, and I invented a way of sampling instead of giving everyone a survey for every damn piece of required training, which seemed preposterous. 250,000, why not just sample? So, you know, um, but that takes, requires time and effort and set of automatic. But the bottom line is, this was all done, this data was gained through interviews and uh, focus groups, not through survey data, except for, you know, net promoter score. Why? Because the company, like before, the CEO was a sales guy. So he can relate to the net promoter score. He can't relate to sort of feedback generally if it isn't aligned to what he wants. But this he likes because it's all about brand love. I'm sure you've all seen this item on your surveys now because everybody and their brother is using it. But do you know where it came from? The net promoter score. You all know this. Would you, would you recommend this to a friend who knows this to you or to a colleague? Bain Capital, when uh, Mick Romney was there running the show, they created the Net Promoter Score, and they collected and updated for it to be reliable. It's just an interesting point. And they have, by the way, some very good uh, benchmarks as a result of that, because they've been collecting for so long. But we got pretty good reaction. The workplace peers, they love the program. The pro mentors, 9.2, they rated it. Uh, yeah, I guess when you add it together, it's 9.2. Uh, and the pro managers, it was a little lower than the workplace peers. There's good reason for that. You, you probably know that 8, 9, and 10, you know, 9 and 10, you promoters, you're 8, 9, 7, 8, or 10 sitters, meaning that they're influenceable. And if you're below 6, as if you got to touch those people and change their lives. So here's just a little bit of qualitative. What is a workplace peer? A workplace peer is somebody who took the course and liked it enough to come back and take it again. You also could refer to them as teaching assistants. But they didn't play the role of teaching assistants because they didn't teach. They were there to sort of guide. That was the model. Now it turned out the experience with the workplace peers was maybe even better than the experience with the students because the second time around they really learned the content. They weren't, they weren't focused on the assignments. They were learning the cyber content. And every one of these folks that were workplace peers got jobs. Now, of course, they were proactive. Came back and said, I want to do it. I'm not including the people who dropped out of the program who didn't like it. So you may know that one of the big tricks around sampling or coming up with good results is by cooking the sample. Right? I'm sure if we really wanted to get a fair reading here, we would find everyone who enrolled and left the program and get their response too. But we don't do that. So it's a little bit, uh, the concept is opportunistic sampling, so just be aware. Another example would be if you went to an ice Baskin and Robbins store and you asked people if they liked ice cream and you'd find 100% of the people in the Baskin and Robbins store liked ice cream. If you went out and said everybody likes ice cream, that would not be a valid use of statistics. You all with me? So, you know, I'm just trying to be honest about these. Normally, people aren't. And of course, percentages of these is to lie about. Don't do that. All right. So they say, you know, they they said, as children we were taught that criticism is bad. But of course, you know, it's not really the case in real life. Can you imagine these are college seniors, and they've never been exposed to receiving feedback, criticism, not mean criticism, just you did a crappy job. You got to improve it. All right. You got to make this better. They've never been exposed to it. That's big. That's a cultural gap in academia. Okay? It's a cultural gap. You can be the biggest asshole on the planet. If you get 100 on your tests, you're gold. Well, that's not the way you're going to succeed in the workplace. In fact, I would say it's just the opposite. You can be a dumbo, but if you treat everybody nice and you look good, dress well, and smell good, you're going to keep the job. And the irritable, the irritable genius down in the carol down there is going to get off. It's just the way it is, unfortunately. Not always, but most of the time. So they're learning, they're learning about that, and then also collaborative environment. They never have to work as a team more than for a short period of time. So that means they have to be able to do conflict resolution. That's a mature behavior. I'm trying to think of a lot of teams in the corporate world get right, but they should. I mean, you can't survive if you can't solve a problem. And actually, as it turns out, one of the reasons why they added A to STEM you all know what STEM is, science, technology, 
engineering, math. They added an A to it, STEAM, science, technology, um, uh, arts, uh, engineering, arts, and math. So what the hell? Why would they bring arts into that? And the answer is they discovered that one of the things that's most important for a cybersecurity team is to communicate what the problem was. And so they have to have people who are literary enough to write up the results in a way that the high-level executives can understand and relate to, as well as present. So that's part of the thing, but that's, I mean, just, just so you understand, the liberal arts, even though it seems like it's dead as a door now, there is a need for people who can actually communicate from a liter literary perspective. They still have to understand the other things to communicate, but the problem they found is sometimes technical people weren't that good at the communication on the side. I don't have any data to show you that, except my scheme is now in. Uh, more collaboration in other classes. They have different types of relationships with their mentors, instructors, and workplace peers. Uh, they say it makes it more like a workplace, that's true. And, uh, oops, sorry. And, you know, these are just some of the findings I have, you know. This is kind of what they do, you know. They, they basically, without meeting them by the nose, they suggest to the team how to deal with what needs to be done all the week. And, you know, I think you have to play the devil's advocate. You need to offer different perspectives. These are students talking about their work with other students. So this workplace bureau turned out to be a big discovery about how to make the program work, because without it, it wasn't as nearly effective. And, you know, some of the findings about, you know, uh, you know somewhere we saw it earlier. Um, and then they talk about their value they receive. You know, I mean, it's pretty boilerplate stuff, um, but I think the bullet here that says, we really had a voice to improve the course, because those workplace peers were used as the equivalent of a, a working group that we could say, this is what we're finding out from our teams, this is how we can improve the session with everybody. Now, you may, how many of you have engaged in design thinking activities? Or how many of you know what design thinking is? How many of you have ever heard of the word design thinking? Heard by okay, design thinking is like red hot right now in Silicon Valley. And it's a sort of, I, I did a presentation, uh, actually Brent sponsored, uh, on essentially the relationship between design thinking and being agile. I know you all know being agile mm -hmm. and scrum, but I'm sure you all know that. So what design thinking posits is the people who do the work get together or are living with the solution get together to devise a design that's going to be better than people who plan it up here for those people. And that's not that different if you know about Scrum and what's involved in the design process for doing an agile, where it's a bottom up process as opposed to a waterfall from top down. Now, what's interesting is a lot of the reason why design thinking is so hot right now, and it's really hot on the West Coast. Stanford and <coughs> Auburn and MIT are the centers of this, but Stanford was the original. They have a night design center on their campus, which runs all these design thinking workshops. It's because the millennials like to feel that they're being valued, that their point of view is, has, is being incorporated. And I'm just, so it involves the workforce from the bottom up in a way that allows them to help design for the future. So naturally, it would appeal this kind of an approach where it lets them weigh in because a lot of their other classes are really just authoritarian. We by week what they have to learn, what they have to put out. There's more flexibility here. Now one could argue that because of the flexibility, how much do they really learn? Because they never receive in this course a test, an individualized test. That has to, in my opinion, that has to be added. But right now it's more like, you know, they have weekly work to do and then the mentors show up. And the way they show up in, in using two ways. The mentors show up as faces up here, and then the students pop in in, in the big frame. But sometimes the students are all distributed, uh, geographically distributed, where each one of these nodes is an individual student. 
And sometimes it's point to point where you have the mentors and then all of the students are in one classroom, right? You've got one student who's presenting, then you've got students clustered around them. Like, you know, I mean, this is a terrible picture. You get the general idea. Now, what's interesting about this is, it turns out, because we're working in an interactive television environment, that one of the key skills is the ability to use that environment to successfully communicate. That's not also on the curriculum. But actually, that's a very useful, those of you who've been in web meetings, I'm sure every single one of you have, that's going to become increasingly big need to run complex virtual global based meetings. So what's interesting here, when it's just single faces, is now you have to have uh, some way for them to work offline. They can do that in a place like NYU, they just get together and meet. But if they're distributed across the state of New York, they're going to have to work in breakout rooms, they're going to have to find virtual means to get together. Here the big issue is really what I call the Cyrano effect. Has anybody here ever heard of a play called Cyrano de Bergerac? Got a big nose. Ugly guy with a big nose. Written by a French guy named Edmund Rostand. And basically what, it, what it's about is this gorgeous, stupid guy named Christian who falls in love with this woman that Cyrano also loves. But he doesn't want to approach her because he thinks he's too ugly. So he becomes Christian's voice. He starts by writing poems for him to recite. And then, at a certain point, Christian standing there and goes, and he talks from the side. Now, 20 years ago, I did a research study on a multi-class room site interactive television network. It was, it was when ITV was just sort of coming in. And so 20 years ago, I did the research for this book. The first time I attended one of these sessions, I said, man, the same problems that I saw 20 years ago still exist. But that's crazy in terms of how people use these systems. And then I opened the email up and there was an invitation to publish this research from this publisher. That was a year ago. So what's interesting is the time's caught up with my research. And uh, the thing about this is you have to force different types of interaction to make sure that not just the extroverts talk. It has to be distributed across. So there are things around that we use gamification and other things that will be used to improve this. But the bottom line is the mentors spend a half hour reviewing their teams, because there might be three or four teams, reviewing a team's uh, output. A mentor is assigned to a team as well. And then during the session, they show to everyone in the class, and the mentor provides feedback. A lot of the feedback initially is just how to present it effectively. You'd be amazed at how bad some of the presentations created by college students uh, poor spelling, bad grammar, poor use of information design. All the stuff that if you did that in a business environment, you'd be out. You wouldn't even last six months. So the feedback they were getting from the vendors, a lot of it was how so. Oh, how do you? And then as time goes on, after a few weeks, then it gets, they start to dig more deeply into the content of the presentation and what role individual roles are going to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's very, very interesting that the mentor role turns out not to just be about cybersecurity, it's also how do you consult in a business environment? Because that specialized knowledge is not taught in college. And that's what they have to deliver if they're going to be successful. And the mentors know the end of it is going to be high ranking officials from J.P. Morgan and the Federal Reserve Bank in the audience, so they want their students to look good. Question, points anywhere? I'm getting close to the end. So, um, the workplace peers loved it. And the mentors, by the way, this is a very boring book, but it's got, you know, it's got some really interesting insights. Cyrano is one of them. But it turns out there's a lot of interesting stuff around how to use ITV to be fairly scratch the surface. And there's one entity that uses ITV the best of all. Can anybody guess who that is? It's kind of, when you hear it, you're going to know why. Military. Who's aware of the military? Space Force. Who said that? <laughs> Damn! 
Yeah, NASA. Because when they're up in space, you've seen their interactive television yourself. But what you don't know is they use that to keep them from going crazy because that's how they communicate with their families on a regular basis. That's how they deal with the consultant medical, and it breaks down their isolation. It doesn't break it down as much as I like to do Mars for 50 years. But. So, actually, what's interesting is when I finished at Vanderbilt and did my research, did this research, I went to the University of Houston because I wanted to do it on TV, and NASA was there, and then that led to the introduction. If I had chosen the internet, I'd be very well to do today. I chose yeah. ITV. But, you know, when, you know when I can't do well, it. Well, I can't do it. So, uh, the interesting question then becomes is, what's the impact on the culture beyond this event? So here's this low to me, and something's happening in there. Well, what about the rest of the universe? And it turns out, this is very similar to the problem in high school, which we encountered, as follows. And that is, in a high school setting, you can go from door to door. One teacher will say, collaboration is good. We're going to work in small groups and do these projects together in school. And you're going to handle the project. And I want you to talk to each other. I want you to help each other. I want you to be a shared, learning, cooperative, global. Then they walk to the next class. No talking, that's cheating. No sharing of information. Listen to the lecture, do what you need to do in the test. Now, I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong. I'm just telling you that culturally it's different. And so what, one of the biggest challenges we have is how do you even describe this kind of a phenomenon in an academic course catalog? Well, it turns out it's tricky. And that's where I would say the biggest challenges are, because as, it's kind of like a bizarre marriage, you know. As the business world penetrates academia, and academia penetrates the business world, they both have to change a little bit. And what's the incentive to change? The answer is, in this case, it's the benefit of the nation, but unfortunately, that's not an easy value to sell to a company because they have their bottom line, or to a university. They have their bottom line, but it's called something called enrollments. So instead of saying how much money we made last year, a not-for-profit university would say, how many enrollments did we get? So if they can enroll a course, well, there's something good about that course, because it's literally their revenues. It's interesting. It's, uh, the two worlds need to come together. Okay? It's not easy to do that. So, but anyway, the... Uh, just to finish up here, some of the things the mentors have to say, um, you know, I, I mean, I've said some of this stuff, so I'm not going to be redundant, but, you know, what we find is, it's not for everybody, uh, but, you know, the timing is set up at the end of the day, so mentors can come in. Uh, it's a, a good, like, this last quote was kind of surprising to me, but... You know, you have mentors who say, I want more feedback on my performance so I can get better as a mentor. So we have to add that to the program. And some of the things they get out of this is, you know, helps improve their soft skills and emotional IQ working with younger people. The content that the course has as part of this is put together by personal <coughs> team of so just by reviewing that content, it raises you know, their skill level improves their coaching skills, and within their own companies, they become experts on how to deal with millennials, because they're doing it. Um, and there's some interesting, there's some interesting quotes here. Um, yeah, there's no differences in, to see people learning for learning's sake in a classroom environment versus doing it because of the they get fired. At least they like that. Uh, people should give back. Uh, I'll just show you this last bit. You know, part of what I'm doing is helping to improve the program. Uh, this is a bit of a crazy framework. Do all these various blue boxes represents various domains for improvement, continuous improvement. And uh, you'll notice your pre assessment. You'll notice your pre assessment comment. Um, see, like that. I mean, it's not as if this hasn't been considered, it's just figuring out how to do it right. And, uh, you know, essentially, just, you know, I mean, this, 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 this program 
even though it has its problem, is rising right now. And you can tell why. I mean, it pitches into an area of business need, it pitches into an area of student need. So I would just say, I, you know what, again, uh, thank you all for letting me come here and talk to you about this. Honestly, uh, if any of you are interested in being a mentor or would like to learn more, to decide if you want to be a mentor, that would be fantastic. And I think it would look good for your professional organization too, as well as for your corporate. So I'm going to ask you to take, so I'm not crushing anyone, please. And uh, at the same time, if you don't mind, have some evaluation for me as well. I know I use the word, just some feedback. Sir, and, and thanks. Is there any, before I go, is there any questions anyone has at this point? What are your biggest cybersecurity issues these kids have to face? Well, the insider threat, of course, focuses on the problem of somebody within an organization who steals essentially uh, reward points. So, what this person's doing is they're skimming off reward points from people who are at the bank and then converting them over into cash coins. So they have to figure out who did it, why they did it, how to prevent this from happening again, how to concretize or make solid the way in which people can do that. And you know, the solution involves things like how you, you handle passwords, how you refresh passwords, how you essentially do psychological profiling, the fact that the bank didn't have somebody who did psychological profiling. They're all doing it now. In other words, the banks and other big corporations are using big data to try to identify potential malefactors. They don't tell them, and then they you know, they watch them. But the kids are basically, their biggest challenge with cyber is understanding the insider threat, how to avoid it, how to redo the topography. Some of the pushback we've gotten from some of our more technical mentors is it isn't technical enough, and I don't disagree with that. We're not trying to train engineers. That's a different problem. However, uh, what I would do, and I'd recommend to the is to add a component like an e-learning course that has a little bit more technical depth on it. But I think, you know, I think what they learn about, you know, in, in this data shows it is they learn a lot about the different roles, like on the cybersecurity team, which role they might want to fill, and they learn what they all have to do, and they learn how to work together. It's the whole thing role. The simulation requires well. So hi, I'm the psychological profiler, and this is my view of what's happening in their presentation. And hi, I'm the cyber, I'm the technical uh, you know, architect who's coming up with a new approach that's going to be safer. But they play different roles, so not everyone plays each role. That's another interesting channel. Do I answer your question? Any other questions? Um, what was the terminology you used for, for the check and see uh, who's uh, set up the phishing uh, hacks? Ah, what was okay. Yeah, what about them? Yeah, what about them? What, 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 what was called? I will send you know, a distri distribution. You all know Gartner, I'm sure. The IT pros know Gartner. So they did a research in 2016 on what they call security awareness training. But what it really is are these companies that have these very unique approaches for testing whether your organization is cyber secure. And so that's what I was referring to. When You're like talking about like no before and social engineering <coughs> type of penetration that's based on social engineering. Yeah, basically. Instead of hitting what they're your is they send a phishing e email to the entire company and then they track to see who opened it. Uh, I'm just curious. Say, I would assume point that each employee is trained before they send this out. Not to be well, that's why they're doing it. So it's a performance based yeah. so they're assessment. Aware that they're, they're aware. Are they aware that this could be happening? Again, it's another, you know, I mean, I hate to use a term like this, but it's another risk mitigation strategy. I mean, basically, the problem is, you know, the CEO says to the CISO, how do I know my people? We all took, everybody here takes. Every year, info protection training, it's an uh, authoritarian training based on Sarbanes Oxley. It's worked really well. <coughs> um, that's sarcastic. Um, so, after they, so they know it doesn't work well, but the leadership knows it doesn't work. So they want, they want performance-based assessment. Essentially, the government missed 
and some of the other entities in Washington are pushing the corporate in the direction of performance-based assessment because they know most of the certifications offered by by SANS, by ISC Squared, and others, there are other Pentia. It doesn't mean they can actually do the work as soon as they can pass the test. It be a difference. So they're all trying to mitigate their risk. And one easy way to do it is you spend $30,000, $40,000, depending on the number of people in the company, to stage a simulated phishing attack. And then you use quick point analysis to figure out who clicked, and then you basically either fired them. You use social engineering, but you don't use that to determine what you do with those people. There are at least three or four companies. There are some that are best agreed. I'll send the Gartner report. Or all right, I didn't, I didn't explain. Everybody is required by law to take equal protection from corporations. Based on the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, after anyone, everyone. Okay. So they're all taking. So they all take. But that doesn't mean that they still follow. No, no, no. I used to work for an indirect degree PD, and we had. Oh my God, we had so many trouble with, with people clicking on things that they shouldn't. How many and years ago was that? Over and over and over again. Same thing. How many years ago? Uh, five to. All that's intolerable. So, you know, what's interesting is Bank of America, when I was hired in there, I didn't know anything about compliance training. I was asked, your compliance training has to change performance in the bank, change behavior. I said, okay. I didn't know what the hell I was saying. Yeah. Then I found out how people take compliance training by talking to my cousin, who man managed the derivatives test. And I said, how do they take compliance? It's something like this. Or then I went back. Yeah. Or then I went. You know, they just went through it. Then I then I went to look at the verbatim feedback, and everyone was complaining that the software was uh, the software was freezing up. So the first design innovation was to make the page forward button drop in a half a second after the rest of it loaded, and then all those complaints went down because they couldn't click past the page before they read. So, you know, or whatever, he's overloaded. So, Ed, I mean, the truth, of the, the truth of the matter is, if you've taken a training for 20 years, you know, you have, which is a lot of people in the banking, the same thing over and over again, you have to, you have to challenge them differently. But the, the difficulty is, even though people know, for example, they're not supposed to leave their laptop in the car when they go into the restaurant and everyone's heard that. Most people do that. They're more room. likely to leave in the restaurant. So, I mean, <laughs> if they do well, take that life, it's an incredible lot. Yeah. Sure. And so, I mean, yeah, they get the training, but until you test, you really don't know. You know, another interesting thing uh, to note is that, you know, for the first time, the ability, like, I don't know if you know the new Macintosh power book is coming out, it has enough power in it. It will run four virtual machines at once. So if you were going to simulate an environment where you have to monitor and control multiple systems around cybersecurity, you could simulate the one machine. So what's happened is instead of needing these Univax to do simulations now, you can simulate in a much more portable and realistic way. The thing about it is the simulation is only as good as the feedback you receive as a result of it. So you know, that's why Singapore and IBM got it right with these coaches who it's expensive as hell, but the government pays for it because they feel they get a better side of the business. Just to add to what you were saying, it's a company I work for. Part of my job is product ties and things like this to sell to businesses. And uh, it doesn't matter how much training people would do. 10 to 20% probably going to put. Especially when Tom Hayward. When that was brought, you know, when that was gives some prizes, that's pretty bad. Before. Find out, you know, find out what your career, next career is I mean, they're very clever. Uh, you know, I was, I was uh, frauded, frauded about four years ago by something that the uh, IRS finally, the, the Department of Justice finally went down. It was, you know, I, I have my own 
is this is going to be one. And I got this recorded message saying that the IRS had discovered a mistake in my taxes and I owed them $5,000. And if I didn't call the IRS immediately, uh, a marshal would be at my door that night to arrest me. And of course, the biggest fear you have when you're an independent business owner is the IRS being audited on your expenses. No matter how honest you try to be, it's still a very it's a scary thing. And they trade on that fear. The number they gave was in DC, and I called it up. It was a phony guy who pretended to be an agent. And they, I, they got about $500 from me before I realized what was going on. They were trying to You'll get, get a tax letter first. Huh? So they'll never call you. Always say, well, that, and I called my accountant's <laughs> office, and my accountant, uh, he's a bunch, so I didn't get the straight answer until out later. <clears throat> but the point I'm making is the psychological pressure here under with the beneficial of Freud. What you want to teach you, this is the same for all compliance, it's the same for the best. Rat them out. It's as simple as that. Rat them out. If something suspicious, rat them out. If you think something is wrong, rat it out. Just bring it to attention, that's all. Unfortunately, there's a, there's a head spot out of it. Yes. I haven't heard you mention screening. Is anybody doing screening? I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. Screening, not screening, just doing that stuff. Absolutely. Tell me about it. Well, it slows down our internet connection at work. Our company doesn't put strong filters on the internet. And these kids are streaming movies and videos and. Music, I mean, it's Is that what you're referring to? Yes, in your case, would they be doing that? I, I wouldn't know. I mean, uh, I'm not sure who you're referring to. Are you referring to the students and uh, all the need for their streaming or within a company of the streaming? Or? Within this framework of curriculum. This is a live streaming web meeting. I didn't see that. I was no, 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 it's all right. So this looks. This, this whole uh, ecosystem on GoTo Meeting is live. I mean, all web meetings are streaming and interactive live videos. So, are they, is that a secure way for them to communicate, or is, what are the vulnerabilities? I don't think there are any vulnerabilities in that. I mean, again, I'm, I don't get your question. If someone else can help, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, I, I mean, he's, you know, most of the from a business perspective is about a family. Thing, so. it, if you're talking about vulnerability from, like, from a telecommunication side, the vulnerability is to a customer that if I subscribe to a 10 meg fiber uh, connection and I've got three people screaming, they can eat up a lot of bandwidth, the majority of the bandwidth. And that's, that's a vulnerability. Is that the biggest problem that slows down? But like, it's not a cyber security issue. It's not a cyber security, but there, there, I mean, there's different... Copywriting, that kind of stuff. Oh, sure, there, yeah. The vulnerability with that is, you know, the ability to screen and record the screen of documentation that can be presented in front of the camera, and then it gets out the proprietary information. That's the vulnerability. Right, and when people are geographically dispersed, Typically, uh, and if it's proprietary information, you don't configure, you don't you don't flip the configuration switch to let them down. If you can watch it, they can't down. But that doesn't prevent them from screen capturing. There are, you know, I mean, right. but no, we don't, we don't reach that. That's something uh, in this particular course. All right, well, I'm, I'm going to take off. Thank you all very, very much.